Hi everyone, I'm Sloan from SloanBella.com and I'm back with another channeled musician celebrity video. Now this person would be 79 years old as of November 27th, 1942. And his music, his presence, his essence is extremely iconic. He's a person who pretty much everybody throughout the generations knows and has heard of. Now I'm going to tell a personal story about this person, if you can say such. And I wanted it to premise it by saying that when people say they're mediums and they connect with people who've passed on, the way that I see it because of my experience with this man at a very young age, I believe he died in 1970. So I was not aware of who he was at the time. I had no idea anything about this kind of music. When I fell into music, I was a huge fan of Queen, not a fan of this man's music. That was just me, I'm OCD, so I'll stick to one thing. Anyway, not the point. I was able to communicate with this man starting at around the age of 11 or 12 without even understanding who this man was. And I wanted to talk a little bit about the texture of that. What I mean by that is a lot of times we assume the dead are dead and they're, they've gone on into one spot. So you're either on earth or you're over there in what they say is heaven and that's it. And that's not the way I see it because through this man's teaching, Okay, through this man's teaching, after his passing through the veil and the dimensions of the Earth's atmosphere, me picking up on his energy, and it's my understanding a lot of people channel this man's energy, it is my understanding that we go to different experiences, different places after we pass. And I was able to pick up on this man's energy at that particular point in my life, having no idea who this man was. It was really quite interesting. I saw him throughout my childhood, 11, 12, 13, and it wasn't until I was 16 years old and I was at a club on Young Street in Toronto and there was a cover band performing Jimi Hendrix music. And they had a picture of the band lead singer guitarist Jimi Hendrix in this particular band it wasn't really him but then they had the real picture of him and I was with a group of my friends and I was like that's the guy I talked to and they were like okay sure because it was so odd and it was such an experience for me my my connection with him came I saw him like a big hologram in the sky and that's the best way I could describe it now we are talking in the early 80s at this point the late 70s and early 80s um, none of what we talk about in our society there were no cell phones there was you know nothing like that but I saw him vividly and he was bigger than life and he would sit down and he would compose music he had so much music that went either by the wayside or that somebody took after his passing because he kept wanting people to get it out there me in particular and I'm not a singer I'm not a musician no one's ever accused me of such <laughs> um, but it was interesting because I was able to hear what he was doing in my head and try to describe it to people which is which is really um kind of confusing for people who don't understand what you're saying. But Jimi Hendrix was the one that taught me one of my most valuable life lessons. When I was a young girl, 16, 16 and a half, and I was about to go down the wrong road of very heavy drugs, okay, very heavy drugs. Drugs that one would use with needles, you know, just try it, I'm just gonna try it. I was actually told by the energy or essence of this man, because I would see his image, and I was told that if I went down that path, I was kind of given insight into where my life would be and what the purpose of the drugs are in our society. So I was given perhaps wisdom or insight into what was going on on our planet in this world at that particular time. And I was shown to pass and I was shown the path that I was gonna take was gonna be extremely difficult because it goes against the path that the energy in this atmosphere one, I was kind of showing that, I was showing different layers. And the thing I equate it with is like different layers of clouds when you come out of an airplane and you come down from way, way up high, like 37,000 feet down to 5,000 feet and you cross 
through bumpy layers, silver layers, um, turbulence layers, flat, fluffy cloud layers. I was seeing in between the layers and each action that I took at this point at my 16 and a half year old life was going to lead me one way or another and it was very destructive. My understanding from my communication with Jimi Hendrix was that he watched out for kids, kids that were runaways, which I was at the time. I had no idea who this man was, as I said, till I walked into that club. Didn't even, didn't even know his existence. I mean, I was didn't have a TV where I lived. I was kind of going from place to place. It just wasn't anything I knew. And when I saw that cover band, I was like, oh my God. Anyway, I learned at that point in time that he was a guardian uh, as such for children that had run away. And he wanted to let people know exactly what had happened to him through trying to help them not make the same mistakes. It was very interesting. So I got the impression at the time that his soul's work or life lesson was actually being telegraphed from the other side. We do continue to work. He was nonstop working. He was creating sound and energy and vibration waves. He was concerned for kids that ran away when he saw somebody who could do this and turn their head this way by the interjection of his energy, quite frankly, saved my thought. I never forgot what was impressed in my mind. It was a telepathic kind of communication. It's not like I heard his voice outside of me, but I definitely saw him. I saw him play his guitar. I saw him holographically. And what he described to me about the use of the drugs that you know, a lot of the kids were taking on the street because of course these kids are kicked out of their home. There's usually trauma in the homes, childhood sexual abuse, violence, stepfathers, you know, the whole thing. Um, crazy mothers, fathers in jail, all kinds of things. What he showed me is those drugs are temporary, but he also showed me the appeal of them in that they open up the mind to the other layers that I was talking about. So when I understood that you can get to those other aspects without doing drugs and, and therefore not jeopardizing your ability to come back whole, I was like, okay, I'm going to step to the right and not to the left. And that's actually, that was actually my experience. I talked about Jimi Hendrix for years, for years, okay? And people thought I was insane. <laughs> and it was really quite interesting. Anyway, Jimi Hendrix was a double Sagittarius. Sagittarius sun by his birth date and Sagittarius rising, the ascendant. Now it's interesting, when you're a double Sagittarius, the sun can sit in front of the ascendant in the first house of expression, like boom, or it can sit in the 12th house music, past life karma, indebted karma, work of a spiritual nature. His son conjunct Venus in Sagittarius lived in the 12th house with his Mercury also conjuncting the 12th house cusp. And then we have his Mars in Scorpio in the 11th house coming up on the 12th house. I will say something about him. His Mars in Scorpio, the way a man shows and expresses himself is through their Mars. His Mars in Scorpio was very apparent. His, um, the dress of the time was, you know, the flare pants, but his, just his funkiness and just the way that he was, was very Sagittarius and very Scorpio. Like he just was different. He was work focused, but gave off a sexual vibe, but was also Sagittarius and you know how they are. Um, his, his moon was in the sign of cancer. Now this is good and this is bad. It's extremely good for intuitive psychic insight. It's extremely good for, um, being nurturing and kind to other people, but they either had a mother, one of two kinds of mother. There's nothing in between. The mother either abandoned them emotionally. So was absent, wasn't there, didn't want the kid, didn't, wasn't able to express herself emotionally, which can transfer onto the person, or the mother was overly attached to the child to the point that you have to separate. I feel like it was the first one. There was a disconnect there. His moon is placed in the seventh house, which is really interesting because it's his emotional nature that can send him on a tirade and can make it difficult in his life. But he tries to balance that emotional nature. And keep in mind, he had Pluto retrograde 
in the eighth house of sex, death, and spiritual communication. So real transformative. So while he played his music, because he played it for me through the other, through the veil, through the other dimension, as he played his music, he was able to transform the energy. That's why he was so electric. And let's not forget his Saturn. Saturn is our karma, our life focus, our path was in Gemini, okay? It is also retrograde, ineffective father. Sorry, Saturn retrograde, no matter where it's placed, ineffective father. Saturn in the sixth house, probably the father had some sort of illness, addiction, problem, etc. And it was conjuncting Uranus, which was retrograde, also in the sign of Gemini. Now, Uranus rules electricity, electric thought, electric behavior, all kinds of things, conjuncting in Gemini his life path, the work that he did on earth through his musical communication. Absolutely outstanding. His guitar playing, his, the way that he brought it and introduced it into the world, absolutely amazing. Caveat to this, and then we have his Neptune in the ninth house, moving up onto the ninth house cusp. Here's the interesting thing with that. The, the Neptune in the ninth house in the sign of Libra, and then we have the moon in the house of Libra in the sign of Cancer, okay? And we have them aspecting each other a little bit negatively, causing conflict on an emotional level. Every time there was an emotional shift energetically for him, there was an expression creatively and then a spiritual connection to it. Understand Sagittarius's on a whole are like this. They're spiritual by nature. Um, and they question everything. They question everything, okay? Why am I here? What's happening? So my instinct from what I'm getting just from his chart is that this man would have been connected to the other things outside of our physical reality. He would have been able to meditate. He would have been able to talk to the dead. He would have been able to do so much. I don't know who he spoke to about that, but I know when he died, he definitely communicated with those that could hear him all over the place. He had not finished writing his music. So I feel like when he died, at the time that he died, and I'm gonna say this, I'm gonna say this straight out. This is a psychic hit, okay? I feel at the time that he died, he'd written a whole bunch of unpublished music, which is now being extracted piece by piece by piece and given to other artists out there by management companies and agents that stole that music back then. Somebody connected to them and on it went like that. That's exactly how it feels to me, okay? Exactly. Um, so when I'm looking at his energy, now let's go into the psychic aspect of this. As I was focusing on his energy, and keep in mind, I mean, for years, his presence was so um, ingrained in the way that I saw things that I never forgot the lessons between one's body and what one could do and how one was not just stuck here. So I was showing through the connection with him that we actually move in different energy frequencies. So let's look at that for a second. They say that dogs can hear certain things that we can't hear, that's a frequency. You can use a dog whistle and your dog will freak out, but you the person, you won't freak out. So if that's actually the case, then he's moving through different dimensions in this world and in the other world. Now, what I got from him, and he's very, um, Okay, he's very flattered by the fact that people remember him and recognize him, but he puts a warning on that. He puts a warning on that. At first, he didn't want to let go of his earthly life. It was not his time. This tells me that something happened to him where it was not his time to pass. It was not what he was supposed to be doing. It was not at all anything that he brought on by his own volition. So that tells me there was a setup to his death. He wasn't supposed to die. He was supposed to be resuscitated. I'm definitely positive of that. The other thing is, what he talks about in the idolization of his name in his physical, I am no longer that person. I am no longer that person. You are tying me to this energy here and I am not that person. He talks about for the first 16 years after he passed, learning how to unthread. He's showing me like thread, spider webbing thread. He's showing me like the webs in the thread, like I have to un unthread 
my connection energetically to everybody that calls out my name. What he talks about is it is a way of pulling the dead back down here. He is not free to go because such energy is a collection in this atmosphere that it pulls him back. Obviously, he's not in his physical body after he dies, clearly. And he's not a person who um, can show up as Jimi Hendrix, okay? In spirit form, he can let us know who he is, but he's not really a person who can understand like how to get back in the physical. Still creative. But what he says is when people mourn the death and they don't set free the energy, the energy stays contained. It's a way of binding. So this is interesting. He was very aware of the chains that shackled him, meaning in the music industry. And he was basically betrayed by said music industry. This is what he's saying. Um, at the end of his life, two months before he died, and this I just picked up this morning because I, I don't really look into it. I, I know that his death was shady. I've always felt that. But two months before he died, he wanted to do something different. He wanted to go off in a different way. And he wasn't able to go off in a different way because of contracts, commitments, and that kind of thing. So he was going to do it. That's one thing about a double Sag hmm, with Sun and the 12th. They're like, you know what? I don't want to do what you want to tell me to do. I'm just going to do what I want to do. And they kind of go off in their own little purple haze and they go off and people get pissed when he wasn't producing and he says I'm so not the person I was I'm so not that person anymore I'm not that person he had so many issues with people around him telling him how he had to go to the next level the way that they wanted him to how they wanted him to present himself now he is telling me and I find this rather funny is that every time he would perform he was given a set of instructions by people around him whoever these people are the managers the the people you know on 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 the stage the event whatever about what was to be expected of him I'm not going to do it so he would go out there, which got him a reputation as being extremely rebellious because he would turn a blind eye and do what he wanted to do anyway because he wanted to do the music. He talks about creating the music and the energy lifting him up, lifting him up, hopefully lifting up people around him. But what he didn't realize, and this is fascinating, he didn't realize that he was being used in order to elicit a certain reaction from the people that he played music for. So the crowds, the, the festivals, you know, Woodstock, whatever. He was being used to create a mindset. He am not that person, he says. He says, I'm not that person. That's not who I am. He was actually pretty philosophical. That's what I remember from from my communications with him. Energy exchange is what I call it. That's what I remember from him is that he was a person who um, was quite eclectic, quite philosophical, very, very interested in the mysteries of everything, and very much a teacher of those who were not protected. So for lack of a better word, I would say he guardianed my actions for several years. Every time I went to go down a wrong path, I still went down wrong paths. But every time I went to do something completely that would fuck me up, his energy would appear to me and there was a discussion. And by discussion, it was a telepathy. It was as if I was understanding two sides of a conversation that I wasn't having with myself. I could visually see him and he always appeared bigger. But the energy was very much teaching me about the direction. If you go down this way. So it was an illustration of not a demand, an illustration of if you do this, this path will be laid out for you. If you do this, this path will be laid out for you. And he says he went through the same thing. He has an affinity for children that are abused, run away. And he also has an affinity for rebellion on all levels. He said he struggled with trying to get acceptance within his own family unit. So that's why he did turn to certain things but he just couldn't do it. And then he was realizing when he died, keep in mind, this is a very young man when he died. Think about it. For anybody over the age of 30, how young somebody in their early 20s is when they pass, especially when they pass and the story is one thing, but his soul is saying another, okay? 
So he was talking about two months before, and when I say talking, the images impress in my mind. He was talking like about two months before his passing, how he had envisioned himself in a different way and he wanted to do something different with his life, but they weren't going to let him because he was a cash cow. I was a cash cow. I made a shit ton of money. And by the way, it was a game they played with him. It was a game of chess. Now what I see around him when I look at this chess, I see in black and white, I see a man in a suit in black and white. This is a manager. This guy kind of looks like Nixon to me. I don't know. I don't actually know if it's him. I don't think so. I don't know why he'd be there. Huge checkerboard guy in a suit over here. There's four of them. They're all talking. Jimmy shows me the pawns. The pawns are him and other people, okay? So there's like 11 people that are really popular at that time frame, around the time frame he dies. And it's like they're pushing them around the checkerboard, deciding, well, person A is gonna do this, Jimmy's gonna do this, person B gonna do that, and moving them around. And when he died, they kept him trapped. They kept him trapped, they took his music, and they kept him trapped. He was trapped. This leads me to believe that he was, because the pawn falls over, he was trapped. So I don't know why, I don't know if he played chess, but I'm getting the chess references. <laughs> I'm gonna have to look that up. Um, he was set up because he was, he was militant about going off in a different direction. Now I look around him and at the day that he died, Leading to two weeks before that, he'd been going astray. He'd been doing things they didn't want him to do. There was a new woman in his life that was not the girlfriend that was there at the time of his death. He'd found somebody else and he actually wanted to go off and explore the world in a different way. He didn't really want to get on stage at that time. I don't really want to do that right now. I got a couple of bucks. I'm going to go off and do this. Um, he kind of wanted to get back to feeling the energy of playing, which he wasn't able to do in such large things. So I get the impression he wanted to go back to his roots and start just like grassroots kind of thing, which he always was to me, but it got so big, not really what he cared for, not really what he cared for. Bunch of off the stage, bunch like this off the stage kind of, um, I just see him kind of that. They made up so many stories around him to fit what they wanted it to fit. And this is what he says, because me in my head, I ask him, what about the LSD? Remember, do you remember the story about the LSD wrapped around his um, bandana on his head, scarf, whatever? And he talks so much about don't do drugs to me when I was younger, okay? So don't do drugs, don't do that. Don't go down that road. You'll be sorry. You'll wreck, you know, you'll wreck your life. You'll go down a different path. Showed me literally a different path, speaking energetically. So I asked about that and he says that was part of what they wanted it to seem like. Like LSD was the rebellious thing, the hippie thing. It's what we do. It's what hippies do. Hippies do this. Um, and not even hippies. He's like, I wasn't even a hippie. I was just a dude and this is what I did. And he's saying more about it being in the black community, who he was and what he did, rather than the quote hippie movement, which he said was a bunch of BS. It was just another diversion tactic. So he shows me all the webs and he shows me how he's trying to get away from the webs, how he's trying to move from these webs. And he's dodging them, he's climbing under them. And he talks about the energy on earth binding him, binding him while he was alive, kind of like, um, Spider webs, but you know when they break into a bank and they put those little pin lights on people, red lights? He's showing me that if he moved this way, a light got him. If he moved that way, it was really hard to maneuver. He was basically trapped. Wanted out of his contract, wanted out of his management team. And bullshit did he die from what they said. I think they said he died from a whole lot of alcohol and pills and of course he aspirated on it. I didn't aspirate on it until, until, and this first time I've heard this one, until they hot shotted me and then put shit in my body. So he was, he's not gonna lie that he was drinking. He did take sleeping pills all the time because he couldn't really sleep and people wouldn't leave him alone. So there were things that were depressants and downers that he did take and he did drink alcohol, but this was not the case on the day that he died. The girlfriend he was with had sold out to his management team. So there was a collaboration between them to get him to do what they wanted him to do, thinking they could use his girlfriend to get him to do it. But he'd found another girlfriend and they chased her off. She is somebody that became pretty prominent in her own life. And I'm not sure who it is. 
Um, I feel like she was somebody that they wouldn't have accepted him dating, so he wouldn't have been allowed to date her. Okay, been allowed. His PR team would have said you can't date her. She may have been married to somebody very prominent at the time and very, very interested in him. And I do hear a French accent or an accent that sounds French to me at the time. So he had these two women, the girlfriend that he was with at the time that he died, listened to his management team, of which there are four of them invested in that. They put a lot of money on this horse, he says, a lot of money on this horse. I was a horse. And they cracked the whip and I was a horse. I was nothing but a human horse. That's it. Now remember, it's really interesting because this man is a water horse in his Chinese astrology, a birth path nine. Water horse, emotional transcendence through the energy ethers. Light, birth path, path nine is the ending, I should say that correctly, birth path nine is the ending of a karmic cycle. He was just like, I'm done. Now what he said is, we don't die, we transcend and I was trapped to the energy here because of all the people that kept calling me. They call. And he said this was on purpose. Once you get, quote, famous, okay, or well-known around the world, anybody, a sculptor, a painter, just think Michelangelo, think Mozart, think whoever. He said they do this and it's a trick. If you're famous, you're going to have girls and cars or boys and cars and money and houses and adoration and nice clothes and you'll do movies and you'll get Oscars or you'll get Emmys or Grammys or whatever. He says that when you go down that road, right, they know they can harness your energy when you die. They use the people, aka your fans, to energetically shift the energy back here to harness your power. He struggled for 16 hours earth years of that time disconnecting. I'm disconnected now. He only comes through when he wants to and they have no control over his soul body. So he's kind of saying he flipped over and did it. Now when he dies, he talks about rolling out of his body. Cannot believe that his girlfriend left him with the manager who let him die. But there was a hot shot first. So something was shot into his body tranquilizer, dark gun, I don't know, shot into his body. And at the time that he was drinking and taking the few pills that he was, it was made to look like at his, uh, something he did himself. I didn't do this. This is not what I did. I wasn't interested. I wanted to fucking leave. I wasn't interested. Uh-uh, not like this. Just not interested. And then they tied me by every single person speaking of me. This is why he says he came to people who weren't really aware of who he was. He was trying to get his message across without being um, known. So people like me, young people at the time, 11, 12, unless our parents were familiar with it, but I had older generational parents, much older than me. Um, again, my mom was in her 40s when she adopted my dad in his 50s. So it was uh, you know, not that generation that listened to him. And quite interesting because I did not know who he was. And a lot of people that I've spoken to since, because he went all over everywhere talking to people for several years. This is when he was tied to the energy of the earth. That led me to believe people like Jim Morrison, people like uh, Jimi Hendrix, people like this, that multiple groups of people in different countries who don't know each other all have experiences metaphysically with them. It's because their energy is bound here and they're still being siphoned energetically through those webs that tie them through people going, oh my God, I miss this celebrity. I miss this musician and mourning and crying. And, you know, just think of Elvis when he died. Hundreds of thousands of people mourning all over the place. How bound was he, right? And no, I can't pick up on his energy. Never have been able to. Anyhow, Jimi Hendrix talks about this. He talks about the, the, the confinement energetically because of his fame, which he didn't even want. He wanted to make cash. He wanted to do his music. But once you go that route, you're then a slave, but not on earth in the spirit realm until you learn how to get out of it. This is what he's saying. They keep calling your name. They keep pulling your energy down. That's not the case with him right now. So this is my first quick video on Jimi Hendrix. I'm just getting back in the swing, but this is my first quick video. So once again, my name is Sloan from SloanBella.com.